Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard Captain Fi, the Financial Independence Podcast. G'day! Welcome to an episode of Captain Fi, the Financial Independence Podcast, where I open the cockpit to some of the best and brightest in personal finance as well as those who've reached or are on their way to financial independence. On board today is Vince Scully, better known to some as the life Sherpa and author of the popular book, The Latte Fallacy. Vince is a licensed financial advisor and with over 40 years experience running a business in the industry, he has actually only just recently reached preservation age himself and is set to retire. Vince and I chew the fat on wealth, financial independence, retirement, and how superannuation fits into the overall picture. Now, super is a pretty massive topic, so Vince and I tackle it from a few different angles, including discussions on the evolution of super, when and where super may or may not be appropriate, some of the different types and structures of super available, the effect of fees on your superannuation's performance, insurance within your superannuation, and of course, sensible asset allocation. We look at the four important focus areas and decisions you have to make when selecting your super and explore some of the trade-offs of the tax benefits of super versus the flexibility of the other investment structures. We also cover some interesting topics such as home ownership, car loans, and the concept of human capital and why early retirement might not be such a good thing. Now, Vince and I don't see eye to eye on every topic and I learn quite a lot from him. Because it's such a big topic and we had such a great time chatting, I've actually broken down this into two parts. My reason for doing this was I didn't want to cut away too much on the editing room floor because there were just too many gems in here to throw away. It actually took over four hours of interviewing to uh, to get the finished product. So strap in and I hope you enjoy it. G'day Vince, how are you going? G'day Captain, it's great to be here. It's awesome to have uh, someone on the show with as much experience and background in the industry as you. So well, at least first... grey hair anyway. <laughs> hey, well, look, at least you have hair, mate. I think <laughs> I'm slowly getting the George Costanza over here. So, um, Vince, mate, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, as I said, I'm uh, a bit of a grey hair in uh, financial advice. I've been doing financial advice since since I graduated in 1983, which is probably before many of your listeners were born. Um, I grew up in Ireland in a pretty comfortable middle-class existence and uh, graduated as an engineer in the depths of the early 80s recession when um, something like 90% of my graduating class emigrated, which was the only thing keeping Irish unemployment down. And uh, from there, I went and did an MBA joined uh, Mobile Oil in their corporate finance group and arrived in Australia in 1988 for a three-week assignment. And um, 30-odd years years later, I'm still here. And uh, all of that time, I've been doing various finance roles from corporate, institutional, and uh, my favorite bit, the individual bit. Um, So it's so much more interesting and pleasurable when you can identify the person at the other end of the money. So as an institutional fund manager, you know, you're dealing with hundreds of millions from super funds or um, big investment companies. And all they want to do is make sure you lose less than the next guy. Um, But when you can actually put a, a name and a face on the person who actually owns that money, it's just so much more interesting and challenging which is what led me to to create life sherpa but i guess we can talk a bit about that later on what do you get up to for fun in your spare time 
Well, now that I actually have a bit more spare time because my boys uh, left school and joined the uh, the adult world, um, I run, swim, and cycle. I um, in two thousand and eleven, I uh, went from ninety five kilos to seventy two, and I had always carried a bit of weight, and um, I discovered the the joys of portion control and exercise, and so went from ninety five kilos pretty sedentary to 72 running a half marathon in nine months and that that a lot of that learning ended up being in the latte fallacy book and in the methodology we use at life Sherpa because the whole fitness and diet and i use diet in the nutrition plan sense there um are so similar yeah. we all know that to lose weight you've got to eat less move more but there's still 10,000 different diets and it's the same with money that we all know we have to spend less than we earn, but there's a, a way of doing that that works for everybody. I'm not very good at portion control, Vince, um, but I do like lifting weights in the gym. <laughs> Thankfully, that kind of offsets it, uh, but it's a very interesting parallel. I've found there's so much that I've learned, um, particularly things like gardening, which relate so strongly to finance and diet is a, is a huge Huge one. Okay, so now Vince, we uh, initially touched base over a post that I did about superannuation and you got in touch with me uh, to actually give me a few tips and a bit of advice. Now, I'd been meaning to track you down because (laughs) as you mentioned, you've written a book, The Latte Fallacy, which has some awesome good stuff about finance in it. And of course, I want to unpack that in a minute. Sure. But um, the the main theme was superannuation. Yeah. So not a lot of people understand superannuation. I don't really understand superannuation. So Vince, what is super, and why should we care? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because you know we all well almost everybody has some. And surprisingly, 30% of the population doesn't even believe it's their own money. And yet, it will be the biggest or second biggest assets for most Australian families. Yeah, It's either the house or the super, depending on how big a house you've got which, and how old you are, which is bigger. So it's really one of the four things that will sustain us when we are either unable or unwilling to work. And, uh, you know, that's the biggest challenge in personal finance. It's making 40 years of income pay for potentially 80 years of life. And Paul Keating, a bless his cotton socks, um, came up with this concept in the, well, it was finally implemented in the very early 90s, but um, I think 91 or 92 might have been the first year. But um, it came out of a... Um, an attempt to kill inflation. Um, So anyone who's lived through the 70s or 80s will know the cancerous effect that inflation has on people's lives. And so there was a deal done between employers, government and union. We'd said, why don't we cut down on wages growth by putting the money into super? So we then cut back some of this demand-driven inflation. And so the concept of everyone setting aside some of their income into a uh, a pool for retirement was born. And that's sort of grown over time. So I think the first year was 2 or 3%. We're now at 9.5%. And there's some debate about whether it should go higher, and if so, how much higher. Because I, I have seen uh, advertisements for some industry super fund where they are talking about it being raised now from the nine and a half, is it up to 12 or 12? Yeah. I mean, that's actually legislated. Um, so it will, well, unless the law's changed, it will happen over the next few years. Yeah. Um, there is now some thought about throttling it back. Um, and I think we need to be very careful when we force people to do something with their own money. Um, that there becomes a bit, you know, obviously it's 
generally a good thing to set aside some money for post work. Um, but you know, should we as a or should the government or we as a nation be forcing people to set aside nine and a half, ten, twelve, fifteen percent? Um, you know, if some is good, more isn't always better. But the point about superannuation, it was only intended to be one of three pillars that support you in retirement. And the first one is obviously compulsory superannuation, and that was going to come with um, a whole bunch of tax benefits. Secondly, you have the age pension, and you know, still 80% of retirees still qualify for some age pension, and that's not going away anytime soon. And the third limb is investment outside super. And so I would argue that, would... that the fourth limb, which the government never seems to want to talk about, is the family home. So if you can get to retirement age with a paid off home and able to generate an income of half to two thirds of your pre-retirement income, um, most people will be reasonably comfortable and nine and a half is going to get you awfully close to that if you look after it well and the looking after it well is the hard bit because it's a really tough decision to make you know where do i put it you know what fund do i choose what investment options do i choose um should i put extra in all those are decisions that as a nation we are hopelessly unqualified to make and access to good advice is a difficult to find and be expensive when you do find it. Well, I know I've previously um, had a couple of, I guess, bad experiences with um, financial advisors. When I first entered the workforce, uh, I, we were chatting about this earlier. Um, somehow I got put into some conservative fund where most of my super was in like bonds and fixed mm. interest cash. And, and as a, you know, as a, 16 year old like that's that's not really appropriate no but but put yourself in the shoes of your employer so your employer is being forced to select a default fund and there's like no upside for him so if he picks a a riskier fund and risk obviously is a figure of speech here but return comes from risk so you've got to take risk to get to return and if it all goes bad there's just no upside for, for your employer. So it's this confusion of retirement savings and employment that creates a lot of that because lots of people involved in this exercise have no incentive to get the best answer for you. The employer is in a tough position. So um, That's actually yeah. a really interesting way to frame it as in what have they actually got to benefit and who who is actually taking the, the risk here. Yeah. And, it's and that's a, it's the, a... that was the big difference when we moved from traditional defined benefit schemes where your employer effectively took the risk and it was there as a perk of office, which worked really well for people who spent 40 years with the same employer to a defined contribution system where all of the investment risk falls on the individual member it's a it's a big industry though isn't it vince i, it I was is. recently three, reading three trillion dollars or thereabouts yeah, three trillion so with with that much confusion uh and you know people not really understanding where their money's going that's an awful lot of money to be just shuffling around it is and that's my point about you know when you as a nation and we've all voted for this um we are forcing the individual to say, we know better than you. You need to put nine and a half or 12 or 15% of your income aside from day one. And yet we haven't actually provided the framework to help them make that, those decisions, um, and it all gets tied up in a whole bunch of ideology. I've, I've never bought into this industry fund, good or bad, retail fund, good or bad. Um, there are good and bad funds on both sides. And I don't think it's helpful to have those sort of ideological arguments. This is people's retirement we're talking about. 
and it is unfortunate that it does get caught up in that um, left versus right argument. And there's so many vested interests, um, you know, whether whether it's the the unions or employer groups or government, and um, there's a temptation for people to treat it as a honeypot to create jobs or build nations. Um, it's actually got one role, and that's building your retirement. And um, you got to be very careful when people are saying, "Well, look, we're going to we're going to invest billions of this in rebuilding the nation after COVID." Great concept, but is that really what you want your retirement money doing? Well, it is a very interesting concept, and that whole idea of you know moving the goalpost or dipping into the honeypot, that was something that really spooked me. And being on the path to, I guess, a conventional fire or you know financial independence, I saw that the super was just so far away, and there was no guarantee that I was actually going to actually get any of it. Mm-hmm which is why I'm aggressively now investing outside superannuation despite the, I guess, loss of the tax incentive. Yeah. I mean, this is a trade-off between, you know, return, flexibility, certainty, and ease. Um, So one of the questions we get asked a lot is, well, should I pay down my home loan? Should I invest outside super or should I make additional super contributions? Which is sort of the three big things you can do with spare money. And there's no doubt about it, making additional super funds, sorry, super contributions will give you the best lifetime outcome because of the tax benefits. You're giving up flexibility and access to the money, and it's a bit more complicated to set up, whereas paying off your home loan is the easiest thing to do. It's pretty certain what the outcome is going to be. It's pretty flexible, but with interest rates where they are, it's going to give you a very low return. Because investing outside super sort of is the middle ground and all of that. So for younger people, and by that I mean you know people who, in terms of their life, you know they they haven't they haven't got to pay down their their home to a good level. They've still got kids. The flexibility of investing it outside super trumps the tax deduction. In my book, so I did some numbers, um, yeah, you know, just to, to uh, illustrate this. You know, so, so if someone starts with ten grand and wants to invest five hundred dollars a month, if they do that for ten years, um, they'll make about eleven grand in profit by paying down their home loan. They'll make about thirty grand if they invested it in something like the Vanguard High Growth Fund, but they get sixty-seven grand if they um, put it in their super fund. Oh but, wow! But so so it, it's an, obviously if you do it for a longer period, the advantage of super does close up a little bit. But it's a massive difference because you're starting with a much bigger pile because you're investing pre-tax effectively, and you're paying less tax on it. And then you get to draw tax-free income when you do actually retire. So massive tax benefits. Um, but you've got to give up access to it till you turn sixty. And if your plan is to retire early, then actually you need another pile as, as well. And depending on how early that pl- you're planning on retiring, you need more of your money outside super. So a lot of the rhetoric um, that you read in the paper so sort of focuses on that tax benefits and ignores a lot of these other things. So... And that's why it's called personal finance, because the answer is different for everybody. That's right. It's very specific to your particular goals. Yeah. So usually we'd say that, you know, start off, you pay down your home loan until you've got your payments and equity position to somewhere that you feel comfortable with. Then I'd focus on investing outside super until I'd got enough to give me the flexibility I need, whether that's paying for your kid's education, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, retire early or have a holiday, start a business, whatever it is that your your goal is. And then, you know, later in life, um, focus on the super. I mean, for me, I've just hit my preservation edge. So it's just a pure tax arbitrage. So I would just be 
leaving money on the table if I wasn't making $25,000 contributions. Ah, well, congratulations on, <laughs> on reaching preservation age, man. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in that transition period when it, uh, when it moves from 55 to 60. So everyone born after 1964, the answer is 60. Um, but I'm in that sort of period where they're shading it from 55 to 60. The answer about super ancient is it's just a tax structure. That tax structure can give you huge benefits. You still have to make the decision as to what I'm going to invest it in. And it's the thing you invested in that makes the real difference. But the comparison I just made was investing in the same thing inside super and outside super. And so the big decision you need to make is what do I, what do I actually want to invest in? And that's driven by, you know, goals, risk tolerance, time horizon. So Vince, you just mentioned uh, that you were putting in 25,000 a yep. year. So is that the limit? Well, 25,000 is the most in a single year you can get a tax deduction for. So either, so the combination of your employer contributions, any salary sacrifice and any other contributions that you claim a tax deduction for is $25,000. You can also okay. put in another 100,000 for which you don't get a tax deduction. And you can bring forward three years of that to get 300,000 in one go. Oh, wow. So, so are there any maximum limits in the fund themselves? Yes. Um, there's been a recent introduction of a total balance cap of 1.6 million. So now if you don't have 1.6 million already, the most you can, so once you hit 1.6 million, you can no longer make a contribution. Of any type. Wow. So, but yeah, $1.6 million will provide for quite a decent retirement, and most people will not get it anywhere near that. My mum just recently retired, uh, and I think she was she was very fortunate. I mean, even as a single mum, uh, she raised me and my siblings by herself, mm. uh, which was, you know, no no easy feat. Um, and so she ended up with, I think just under half a million. Mm. Um, now she, she was very fortunate. She had a defined benefit scheme and, um, basically used that to pay off her house. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, so it is interesting to see how much people, people have because, um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of finding out that, you know, a lot of people don't have much in their super when they retire. That's right. The biggest one I've seen was 300 and something. Um, which apparently is is in the top ten funds in the country. But wow! I I have actually seen that fund, um, but those those sort of things will will not happen in the future. Because if you go back to yeah you know, the late eighties, early nineties, when complying funds uh, nineteen ninety one I think is the Superannuation Industry Act, which created the super fund as we know it. Um, back then there were no limits and then they brought in so you could put as much as you want in um, and there were limits on how much you could take out tax free a thing called a reasonable benefit limit and then the Costello budget introduced tax free income on the way out and capped the amount that you could put in and that cap is slowly being reduced you know, one of the top, we've got a, a benchmark that we use, which looks at how many months pay you should have in your super fund based on your age and at retirement, sort of a hundred months is a good place to be aiming for. And that will give you, you know, 60% of your pre-retirement income. So should people be, that 1.6 million cap, mm -hmm. should people be trying to, target that or how do you make sure how can we make sure that we're getting the maximum benefit from yeah. our super i mean there's a lot of people won't earn 1.6 million in their entire lifetime so i think we need to put that in in context um but once you've got the flexibility bit provided for then clearly we should be maximizing it as a general rule but you know, for most people that's going to be later in life, like, you know, 
40s. Um, so I, I wouldn't be recommending that most 25-year-olds put extra payments into their super fund, that they would be better off generally in paying off their debts, building an emergency stash and putting a deposit in their house to get it. Um, it's when you get older, then the trade, the flexibility trade-off becomes a much less of a problem and then just go for the return. Um, so that would be my, that's my general take on this one. Um, well, yeah, I would a hundred percent agree with you, Vince. I think, you know, getting rid of non tax deductible or toxic debt, like credit, credit cards and car notes. I think that's probably spot fires that need to be put out. Um, and I of would course, disagree with you on the car bit, but certainly all that other stuff, Oh, I don't you don't mind the old car notes. Well, um, the the and I, one of our most popular articles on our website is called "Why Paying Cash for Your Car Could Be a Big Money Mistake." Um, is that the thing? And we get a bit off track here, but the thing that matters about buying a car is how much you pay and how long you keep it for. The interest cost is actually less than ten percent of the cost of owning the car. Now, this is not an excuse to go and borrow, pay 40% interest, but at, <laughs> at reasonable home at reasonable loan rates, which are you know one or 2% above um, home loan rates, you the thing that that does is it puts the depreciation into your cash flow. And the depreciation is 40% of the cost of owning your car or more. And if you pay cash, you you suffer the pain of loss of the cash at the same time as you get the pleasure of that new car smell. And you forget about it when you know, the car is not quite so new and doesn't quite smell so good until you then go buy the next one. Whereas if the depreciation turns up in your cash flow every month, it reminds you of how much this car is actually costing you at the time that you're consuming it. So that's reason number one. More of a, bit, more of a behavioral thing. Yeah. Which is sort of the same reason why paying off your the smallest debt first gets you better an answers than paying the highest interest rate one off first, even though mathematically it doesn't make sense. And then for most people, um, you're borrowing the money anyway, because if you have 30 grand in your pocket, um, your choice is do I pay off my home loan or invest, or do I pay cash for my car? So... By choosing to put that $30,000 into your car, you are increasing the amount of home loan interest you're going to pay, or you will foregoing an investment opportunity. And um, that can be particularly material. There's a case study we do on the uh, in that article where if you were going to buy a home in the you know, two years after you buy the car, the amount of and you diverted your deposit to paying for your car, you could actually increase your lender's mortgage insurance bill by as much as the price of the car. So it does come back again to the point we made earlier about it being personal. Um, but I divide debts into three types. I don't buy the good debt, bad debt argument. Um, I talk about red debts, which are generally credit cards and personal loans that arise mostly because you're spending more than you're earning. And they generally have high interest rates and they're generally not tax deductible. So they are corrosive. So if you're paying 20% interest on your sofa, um, that's going to eat up a lot of cash that you could spend on something else. Um, and they're harder to get rid of because, because you're incurring them because you're spending more you're earning. You first of all have to reduce your spending by the excess and then you have to reduce it a bit more in order to start eating into the principal. So that's why they're so corrosive. The next one is sort of amber debts, where I would put your home loan and your car loan. And they are about spreading the cost of an asset over the period you're going to use it. And it's consumption, but what matters on both occasions is how much you buy. And the third category then is the green debts, which is sort of investment debts and your hex. And I would repay them in that order. 
So my solution, and you might laugh at this, <laughs> I, I just drive a shit car, Vince. It doesn't yeah. really cost Oh, sorry. Much. I was not <laughs> using that to justify going and buying a flash car. As I said, what really matters is how much car you buy. And most of the financial stress that I see is people who've bought too much house or too much car. You know, we'll probably talk about this later, but that's one of the fallacies that go along with the latte fallacy, that the things that you read in the paper about what's good for your wealth or good for your money health, often either just plain wrong, it's driven by vested interests, or it was true 40 or 100 years ago, um, but is no longer true. And that's why the book is called The Latte Fallacy, that giving up your morning coffee or your smashed avocado is not what's keeping you out of the housing market. The example that I always give when I talk about that is if you go and buy an, a, a house or an apartment, you walk in and what does the agent say? The agent says, this will sell in the low 700s. Right? That's a phrase you'll hear agents use. And that's sort of code for somewhere between 700 and 750. Well, the difference between paying 710 and paying 735 will pay for a lifetime of lattes. And nobody thinks twice about that extra 25 grand. Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Hmm. So, so Vince, um, yeah, sorry. back to back to <laughs> super here. Yep. So, I mean, I guess we kind of talked a little bit about the priorities um, about which you might choose to, yep. you know, pay off debt, pay down a mortgage, hmm. invest outside super. Okay. Um, but obviously, even an early retirement contains a conventional retirement in the end. So it it's does. not something that we should completely discount. Oh, no. I would, you know, it's obviously a key plank in your planning. I'm just suggest saying that you should think very carefully about the trade off you're making between tax benefits and the flexibility you're giving up. Flexibility is a huge part of my motivator right now. And that's, right. For instance, and that's why I've stopped making additional super contributions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. about financial independence, retire early or fire. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the fire bit um, because everybody, no matter when you plan on retiring, needs to achieve fire. And we all start adult life with an abundance of human capital, which is largely embodied in our ability to make a living. So that's education, personal attributes, skills, so, I mean, you can obviously do stuff to improve it by you know, getting a pilot's license or um, getting a qualification. Um, and over our life, working life, we need to convert enough of that human capital into financial capital to pay for the bills when we're either unable or unwilling to work. And so the fire bit is really just arguing about how fast we make that conversion. If we're diving into particular types of super, I've heard the term self-managed mm. super fund. Self-managed super fund has a specific meaning and that's a structure where you become the trustee of your own fund and they're regulated separately under a different um, regime. They're regulated by the tax office rather than by APRA and that's taking on a lot of the responsibilities for both that compliance and administration as well as the investment side of things. And there are I know, three quarters of a million of these. Um, and 20, 20 years ago, it probably was the way to get control. Like it comes at a cost and an administrative overhead. Um, you know, it's pretty difficult to run a self-managed super fund for less than fifteen hundred dollars a year um i mean mine i spend twelve hundred dollars on admin and i pay the atl levy of 300 and something on mine um so if you so if you just work out what 1500 is so on a hundred thousand dollars that's one and a half percent so you need a reasonably substantial pool to make it cost effective and now there are lots of ways you can get the same level of control without having the hassles of a self-managed super fund. So there's a whole bunch of 
platforms um, or wrap accounts that give you, and even some of the industry super funds are now allowing you to directly choose individual stocks. So the only real reason why you'd need a self-managed super fund is if you want to invest in something special, like you want to invest in your business premises, which was very common among small business people uh, and medicos who often own their practice building in their self-managed super fund. Or you want to invest in you know, exotic assets. Now, query whether they're actually good investment decisions, but that's a sort of a separate point. But you can get most of the benefits using some of these wrap products without much of the cost and admin hassle. And if you intend on going overseas, having a self-managed super fund is really problematic because you can't actually have a self-managed super fund if you're not a tax resident. So if you're planning on retiring overseas, that's a bit of a problem. So they, they, they have their place and, you know, it's probably a third of all super fund money is in them. But, you know, I see an awful lot of people with very small balances um, being sold a self-managed super fund to invest in real estate. And it almost always ends in tears. On, on the bulk of cases I see, um, it doesn't work out very well. Okay, so it could be a, a maybe a bit of an overly complex structure for the the general. But for person. small business people, um, they they have their place. Um, so I had the um, and don't try this at home. Um, there was a lot of structuring went into this, but part of my old business that I sold to Mark Boris was owned by my self self managed super fund. And now that that's all unwound, I'm actually in the process of winding up my self managed super fund because it's just too much hassle. But it had a specific role and small business people, um, there are lots of advantages. So you, Vince, you touched on um, the fees uh, of an SMSF. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard word to say, isn't it? <laughs> you, t you touched on the fees being, yep. you know, you need to have a, a certain balance for it to basically be worthwhile. Yep. Um, I've seen, you know, I've seen the articles, I've seen the headlines about the effect of fees, but just how powerful uh, are the effect of ongoing fees on our super balances? They make a huge difference. Um, and you, you, when you look at that comparison between you know, normal super and self-managed super, you've got to be careful as to what you're comparing. So you can get all of the trading stuff you could possibly want in a self-managed super fund on a platform. And if you take that comparison, the break even is more like six or seven hundred thousand dollars as a balance to make it work. Um, if you're comparing it to um, something like a small APRA fund, they the break even might be lower. So you've really got to look at if I'm if I'm trying to achieve something that isn't investing in normal investment products, i.e. shares, ETFs, bonds, managed funds, um, like real estate, gold, collectibles, um, businesses, peer-to-peer -peer lending, crypto, um, then a self-managed super fund doesn't give you anything that a wrap doesn't do. But if you want to do one of those things, it's the only answer. So it really is horses for courses. But most of what I see could just as easily be done on a, a wrap platform. And um, there's just a heap of admin and cost uh, involved. I mean, I keep my cost down because I do all of the accounting so I just hand over the accounts to the admin service at the end of the year and they do all the lodgements and tax return. I'm just talking generally here yep. for someone who doesn't need an, a self-managed super fund mm -hmm. and who can use one of the yep. 
Sorry, and you called it a wrap? Fund? Yeah, uh, that's a bit of a th Technically, they're called investor-directed portfolio services. That's the technical serve. But they they colloquially refer to as wrap accounts. And it, it's again, it's just another structure. So it really just delivers the superstructure. And the main players in that are uh, you know, Colonial, um, Net Wealth, Hub24, Premium, BT, Macquarie, Asgard, there would be a dozen or more products. And it's really just a, a – it's in the UK, they call them investment supermarkets, which I think is probably a better word, which is really, um, you know, when you go into Aldi, you get to choose whatever product's on the shelf in Aldi and put in your basket. And so it is with one of these um, wrapper cans that you can effectively – they take the role of the trustee of the super fund. And they will have a an RSE responsible superannuation or registrable superannuation entity license, and they will um, you say actually I want you to buy twenty thousand BHP shares using my super, and those shares are held for you, and they're your they your BHP shares, and what other people on the wrap do doesn't really affect your outcome. Um, okay, so that's essentially a almost like a broker, but for your superannuation. Yeah, um, and it's but it's just a structure. So it it is a super fund in which you make all the investment decisions and instruct the trustee to do what you tell them to do, and they go and do it. So and then these are then are these different from the default funds that we might be? Yes, in? none of them will qualify as a default fund. So you will need to positively make a decision, but you can tell your employer to put your SGC contribution into your net wealth account or into your Hub24 account or your BT Panorama account. Um, buying them is not, I mean, if you think choosing a super fund is hard, um, working out which of these platforms to use um, is an even tougher discussion. And then you still have to make the investment decision as to, what it's actually going to be investing. And that's the thing that really matters. The rest is around um, fees and structures. Um, so buying VDHG or Vanguard High Growth Fund on the net wealth platform will give you exactly the same result as buying it on Hub24, but for the difference in fees. Putting the same thing in a Sun Super out of the, the Sun Super indexed options. The only difference between them is fees and structure. So Vince, how do the structures differ? So for example, uh, to use these wrap accounts yep. versus some of the default funds, mm -hmm. like, you know, we see yep. Sun Super, mm -hmm. uh, Rest, uh, Host Plus, those mm -hmm. kind of players. What are the, what are the differences between those funds? Yeah. The main difference um, is that they will not be default options. So in order to be a default option, you need to qualify. The fund needs to be a my super qualifying fund, which is a standard the government set up, which says you, you've got to have a, you've got to meet all these criteria. You've got to offer some insurance. You've got to, uh, some pretty arcane rules you've got to meet. And that then allows you to qualify as a default, which is either chosen by your employer or as a result of some industrial relations agreement, either an enterprise bargaining agreement or an award. And if you don't make a choice, that's where your money will go. And that's designed to you know, catch all those people who are just not engaged that the money just doesn't disappear. The 9.5% will go somewhere and it will be into a fund that's had some form of vetting. It's not a guarantee of performance. It's not a guarantee that it's good value or that it's the right allocation for you, but at least it's met some basic tests and they're largely around insurance structure. And so you will actually have to positively make a decision. And when it comes to making a decision, 
Um, the first thing that matters, you know, there's probably four things that really matter when you're making a decision on a super fund. The first thing is asset allocation. So what am I, what assets am I actually going to invest this thing in? And that's a function of, you know, age, amount, risk profile, goals and objectives. And um, so you'll be familiar with terms like balanced growth, high growth. They're labels that sort of indicate how much of your money is going to get invested into what are known as growth assets. And they're things that over time can outpace inflation, which generally means shares in real estate as, a, as opposed to defensive, which generally means bonds and cash. And the balance between the two is what generates your return. So as a young person, generally you need as much growth as you can tolerate and enough defensive to help you sleep at night. So most people uh, who aren't really familiar with super are probably going to find themselves in one of these uh, default my yeah. super yeah. funds. And most of those that my super version will usually be a so-called balanced fund. Now, balanced, when I started in this industry, meant 50-50. <laughs> um, today, it usually means 70 to 80% growth, at least in the PDS, that's what it'll, what it'll mean. And for many people, particularly many younger people, that is likely to be too conservative. Um, and of course, you don't always get what it says on the pack. Um, so for example, the host balanced option in the PDS says it's a 76% growth, 24% defensive, but it gives itself a range, which means theoretically you could end up with 100% growth or 35% growth, and it would still comply with what it says in the funds. And given that this is the most important decision you can make with your super, um, it's the first thing you should look at. So work out what you need and then find a product that delivers that. Um, and with the case of Host Plus, you know, if you go and look at the APRA um, reports, that shows 93% growth for the Host Plus balanced option. Despite the fact that they've said in the PDS is we're targeting 76.24. How do you decide that, Vince? You mentioned that it's, you know, for young people, you generally want as much growth as you can tolerate and enough defensive to help you sleep at night. Yeah. But how do we make that personal decision? And, you know, what's your opinion on 100% growth? Yeah. Um, this comes back to the whole theory of portfolio construction. So a lot of the work that um, Eugene Farmer, now this is relatively new technology. Most of the portfolio construction academic works was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Like it's quite, it's in my, in my adult lifetime, a lot of this work was done. And that's about, well, how do I put together a portfolio that meets my requirements? And your goal is generally to maximize return for the level of risk you can, you can prepare to accept. Now, note that does not say beat the index or maximize returns. It's maximizing returns for any given level of risk. And that means picking not a portfolio of winners. You know, it's like a, a footy team. A team of champions doesn't make a champion team. And so it is when it comes to a portfolio. So you can just go and say, well, what are the, you know, I need some diversification. Let me pick the five highest returning funds and put a fifth into each of them. Um, what matters is how they behave relative to each other. And that's where these defensive assets come in. So traditionally, bonds, which are really debts of governments and big corporates, behave differently to shares, which are interest in companies. So usually when economies are booming, shares are rising, bonds will generally behave less well. 
and vice versa. So when the economy tanks, share prices fall, interest rates often fall because governments want to stimulate economies, therefore bond prices rise. So that opposite behavior is the thing that actually gives you the benefit. So a bond is not the same thing as putting money against your home loan, even though they both might pay 3%. It's because of that change in capital. So as interest rates fall, bond prices rise. And so last year, if you'd invested in a gov an Australian government bond ETF, you'd have made 4%, despite the fact that government bonds were paying 1%. And that's because as interest rate falls, bond prices rise. So it's this opposite behavior. So you could actually construct a portfolio that gave you a bigger return than either of the things you put in it, if that makes sense. So by buying 90% ASX 200 and 10% Aussie government bonds, even though you know, ASX returns, call it eight and a half over lengthy periods, bonds maybe two today, um, but add the two together can actually give you a better overall answer. So this is more proof that if some is good, more is not better when it comes to investing, that you know, some ASX 200 is good, but 100% ASX 200 is not good. But there is a, a right number. So you need to have a mixture of both growth and defensive. Um, and for younger people, the 90-10 is often a bit of a sweet spot that you... You gain a bit of um, return pickup and you lower your volatility. So your return per unit risk actually goes up. And that's what matters. So it's not what the absolute return is. Is What matters is what return did I get for the level of risk I took? Now, that is a very interesting concept, the risk-adjusted return. Yep. So for young people that might have 40 years or so until preservation age, mm -hmm. sure, should they be happy to accept a higher level of risk? Higher risk if you're going to get higher return. So, and that's the distinction I make between higher returns and better returns. So you could find that the extra risk, the extra return you get for taking that extra 10% of risk doesn't give you the same bang for your buck as going from 80 to 90. Okay. So there's a, it's not a linear relationship. It's also not as precise as the academics make it out to be. Um, so there is a benefit in terms of improving your risk adjusted return by adding some defensives. And if you're going to add defensive, you want to add as risk-free defenses as you can which in an Australian context means Australian government bonds. That's as close as we get to our risk-free asset. It doesn't mean it's got no risk, but it's the benchmark against which all other risks are measured. So bonds, not all bonds are created equal. So if, if the purpose of adding bonds to your portfolio is to smooth out returns and give you a bit of correlation benefit, taking risk in the bond component makes zero sense. So that would be if you were to get junk bonds or risky or, bonds. Or global bonds. So adding currency risk um, doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you're a 90-10 you know, or 95-5 type investor and you're only adding the 10 to give you that risk-adjusted benefit, you want to make sure you're not taking any risk in there. So you wouldn't include overseas bonds in there you wouldn't include junk bonds as you say but if you're adding bonds for income then maybe you do um, so someone who's in retirement and has got 30 40 50 percent bonds they now want to get some return from that component whereas if you're only adding it to dampen the volatility you want to make sure you're not taking it any risk and therefore in australia that means generally government semi-government bonds and you wouldn't buy offshore bonds most people might be in these default my yep. super funds 
Um, will, will this be automatically taken care of? Like, will we, will they be investing in the Australian bonds? And without picking on House Plus particularly, I just happened to have the PDS open for our discussion. Um, their balanced fund has zero to 15% in cash, zero to 20% in diversified fixed interest, uh, which I would assume would include some global stuff. And it's got zero to 20% in what they call credit. Now, credit is code for higher risk. Um, credit usually means lower rated and often structured debt um, like mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities. Um, so if you've watched The Big Short, you'll, you'll know what that is. Um, so... Now, they're not all the same, so just, that's not a, don't take that as saying you shouldn't be investing it. But very little of that is actually performing the role that you would expect your little bit of bonds to be delivering in a predominantly growth portfolio. Makes a lot of sense. So if we were constructing a portfolio for someone who was looking to retire on it, you obviously do want to include some global bonds because you want diversity of issuer and diversity of yield, you would probably hedge it back to Australia, which will give you a bit of a improvement on your return because Australian interest rates are higher than offshore rates generally. And um, it gives you greater choice in the lower credit rating. There's not a lot of lower credit rating issuers in Australia. Once you get below the you know, single A rate, double A rated, big corporates. So big corporates like Fortescue Mining, uh, Blue Scope, BHP, um, Borrell. There's not a lot of lower quality issuers here. So if you want to move up the risk curve in Australia, you've really got to take bank hybrids, whereas you get a much greater choice offshore. And then hedging it back gives you a bit of a return enhancement so a retiree looking for their bonds to provide income would want to do that but if you're buying bonds to give you smoothing you don't want to be taking any risk so you want to be buying australian government bonds and you just can't tell from reading this but i would expect that diversified fixed interest means would include some global I thought Host Plus seemed like a, a really good choice. So I actually opened an account. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents opened accounts um, because it looked like it I could think give you us... And, you and $2 billion of other Australians, you, you're certainly not alone. Yeah, well, the so the, what drew me in personally was the indexed options. Mm -hmm. So Because I keep hearing about how important the fees are. Yep. And if I can get an indexed option and instead of paying 1.2%, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I, I think it's like 0 0.06 or something or 0.12 for the yep. international. Um, that just seemed like an incredible option. So I've, um, you know, maybe I need to rethink this strategy after yeah. our, our chat yeah. about defensive I mean, asset allocation. Yeah. I mean, we started with, step one of the four steps in choosing a super fund. So asset allocation is the number one driver of returns. So start with your asset allocation and then find a, a fund that actually delivers that. And, you know, if you were, you talk about index, I mean, people, the reason people buy indexed funds is because they know that the efficient, that markets are efficient and that as a general rule, active fund managers don't outperform those benchmarks. You know, there's no end of academic research that would support that. So if you were then going to go and buy a, an index fund where the manager is trying to time the market by moving your asset allocation around, why do you think they can do a better job at picking asset, asset allocation than they can do at picking shares? So if you, the reason you would buy index funds is because you believe that markets are efficient and therefore you don't want to waste money paying someone to actively trade. So why are you paying someone money to actively trade asset allocation? That makes zero logical sense. 
Okay, so that's if you were in the balanced fund? Yeah. Well, even in the index balanced fund, um, it's got big ranges for its asset allocations as well. So it could, in theory, be anywhere from 100 zero to 50-50. And yeah. the target is 75-25, where it actually is, according to the annual report. Specifically, what I've done is... I've done that step one yep. and I've picked, okay, I want to be 100% growth. Yep. So I've picked um, 50% Australian index shares. And mm -hmm. I think that's the IFM yep. manager. And then I've gone 50% indexed international. Yeah. So you've now taken away the manager's ability to trade asset allocation. So you've gone and said, I want 50 global, 50 domestic you know what indexes they're supposed to be tracking and quite know how they're doing it, but you certainly, so you're, well, sorry, that is obviously an asset allocation decision that you've made and the manager doesn't have any discretion around that, which brings us on to the, so number two is transparency. So can you pick up this document and know what you're getting? So if you were saying, I want to invest in Australian shares and I want an index investment, do I know what index is being tracked? Do I know how that index is being replicated? Is it 100% physical shares? Is it sampling? Or is it some other mathematical algorithm? And the index the the name of that IFM fund is called something like an enhanced passive something which we don't know what it is but it would suggest to me that there's some algorithm in there that's not a pure market capitalization index so the question you've got to ask yourself is do I know what I'm invested in has the document clearly articulated that and can I explain it to my partner? If the answer to that is no, then you need to ask some more questions. And some of these funds are better than others of, at answering those questions. So I mean, you're probably familiar with Case Against Rest, where the guy wanted some information on how Rest took into account environmental issues, and he was fobbed off and had to go to court. Um, so transparency, and transparency then moves also beyond that. So if you're in the balance fund, for example, it's investing in infrastructure, private equity, and real estate. Um, how are they being valued? So when you get to the end of the end of the month, um, so if you're buying BHP, all you have to do is look on the screen and you know how much it's worth at every instant. If you go and buy a 20% a, a share of Brisbane Airport, the only time you actually know what that's worth is when someone else trades it. And until then, the valuation is based on a, a financial model that's probably run by a graduate analyst. And having done this in a previous life, um, I know all the tricks you can get up to on those valuations. Yeah, so you change a GDP assumption, you change a inflation assumption, you change a you tweak all these assumptions and you can you can make those models tell you whatever valuation you want. Um, we used to have a saying that says, if you torture the numbers for long enough, they will eventually confess. And so <laughs> you have no idea how these things are valued, which is a bit of a red flag for me. And that's not, that's not just a host plus problem. That's a general problem with investing in illiquid, unlisted assets. Brisbane Airport will have a whole bunch of restrictions on it. So usually the other investors get to, if you want to sell it, the other investors get to have first dibs on it. Um, so it's often very hard to know what they, they're really worth. And there aren't that many buyers. So if you, if you own 20% of Brisbane Airport, there's probably less than a dozen buyers around the world. So it's it's very difficult to scrape away and say, what is this actually worth? 
And that's why one of the other attractions of index funds that you know precisely what's in there. So you can go on the, the BlackRock or BetaShares website and download precisely what's in your um, ASX 200 ETF. Whereas if you're in a, you know, a fund that's got some unlisted assets, they might list the big ones, but you've got no idea how they're valued and you have no idea whether that's realistic or not. So, yeah, and for that exact reason was why I wanted to personally avoid the infrastructure funds. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the Australian Shares Fund seemed um, yep. attractive to yep. me. So that, that, look, tick, that ticks the transparency box. Well, it goes a long way to ticking the transparency box. Um, but you actually don't know what algorithm is being used in this enhanced passive strategy. With that being said, um, to get the full level of transparency, should we be, I mean, I say should we, I said to get more transparency, could you use something like these wrap yeah. so funds? You could, so you could buy a 50% Aussie shares, ASX 200, and 50% MSCI World X Australia, where you know precisely what's in it. Um, in super, that would be about point. Tip, the fund that we would use um, would be about point three eight percent with no fixed fee. So the and the fixed fee that dollar fifty a week that doesn't sound very much, but it's one percent on a seven thousand eight hundred dollar balance. It's thirty basis points on a twenty five thousand dollar balance, which is a typical balance for a twenty something. So you do have to look at the overall cost. That admin fee, which is a dollar fifty a week for most of the big funds, or two twenty five for Aussie Super, um, is actually material for smaller balances and doesn't get counted in the return because it's a fixed fee. So when you look at your return, that return is before the seventy eight dollars. So. So that would be one way of doing. So you could take a a wrap or a master trust and select individual funds that meet the requirements we want. So you could buy a ASX two hundred index fund and a MSCI World X Australia managed fund or index fund, and you would know precisely what you had. And you okay, and then if you, going back to the step one. Yeah. If you wanted to have that 90-10 or 95-5 mm. or however yeah. you wanted to break down your allocation, you could then go ahead and buy 5% into a bond fund, something yeah. like that. Yeah, whatever. Hey, guys. Going to wrap part one up here. Vince and I are going to continue our discussion on superannuation in part two. Um, we'll pick up our discussion halfway through the uh, four steps to selecting your super fund. Uh, the first one here we talked about was asset allocation, the second being transparency. Uh, and so we're going to pick up the chat from uh, the next point, which is structure. Uh, I hope you got a lot out of this episode. Really looking forward to getting part two out to you guys as soon as I can, uh, so we can basically wrap up everything for you neatly. Thanks very much for listening, and uh, as always, uh, you can check out the website for the show notes. I'll have links to things that Vince and I have discussed on the show, uh, as well as some more information from him and links to his book and articles that he's written for his blog. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Captain Fi Financial Independence Podcast. To read the transcripts or check out the show notes, head over to www.captainfire.com for all the details. If you have a question for the captain, make sure to get in touch. You might even make it on the airwaves. You can reach me online through the Captain Fire contact form or get in touch through the socials. I'm active on Facebook and Instagram as well as a number of online finance and investing forums. And finally, remember, the information presented on the show and the links provided are for general information purposes only. They should not be taken as constituting professional financial advice. 
You should always do your own research when making any financial decisions and make sure it's appropriate for your personal circumstance. 